Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to offer you all a really warm welcome to um, to today's um, CACOP webinar, which is um, um, resourcing to risk. Um, I'm joined by my colleague Gemma, and we're going to sort of do some introductions as well um, as well shortly. I can see um, um, I have in front of me on the sort of dashboard um, a list of attendees, so I can still see people are still joining. So I'm just going to give um, um, people just a few more minutes to um, to join the webinar. Um, we have um, we have delegates um, from lots of different organisations joining us today. So we're we've got um, all three emergency services covered. So um, um, certainly lots of fire services. We have um, um, some police services and ambulance service trusts as well. Um, we're also joined by a few other um, sectors as well. So we've got some government customers and some and some commercial organisations organisations as well. I think looking, I was looking at the delegate list earlier, and um, there is a bias towards fire services. So we do have um, um, a lot of fire services joining us um, today, and certainly when we, um, my colleague Gemma is going to be presenting um, some case studies um, later, and I think some of those are um, do have a um, a lean towards fire services. But I suppose what I would say to um, to other emergency services and other people joining us today is that the concepts we're talking about very much apply. Um, to other emergency services and um, and other organisations, so you're you're in the right place. You've signed, you've signed up to the webinar, and we've got a lot of um, interesting um, um, content that we're going to um, we're going to cover. Um, so I'm just looking at the delegate list. It looks like um, we're we've got around about 60 delegates joining us today, um, and it looks like most people have um, have signed in now. So I think we'll we'll get we'll get started. Um, There'll be people joining us um, throughout, um, um, I'm sure, arriving um, in the next five minutes, but that's also absolutely fine. But we'll we'll get we'll get started. So we're on we're on time. Um, so um, the plan, um, um, the plan um, for this webinar, um, I suppose before we start, I've, I have a sort of a bit of administration um, that we'd just like to um, to cover off. Um, so this um, webinar will be recorded, and we'll be making um, this recording available to um, to delegates after the event. Um, so you will get um, access to um, access to that, which is um, which is great. Um, within um, GoToWebinar, which is the um, application we're using today, there is a questions um, option. So the, at the top of your screen, there should be a square box with a question mark in it. Um, um, you can use that to um, to ask questions at, at any point throughout the um, out the webinar. Um, there's two people from CAC Corp today, myself and Gemma, so we may try and answer questions as we go, um, but if we don't, we have a, a Q&A section um, planned for the end, so we'll run through um, um, questions um, then. So um, so please do um, do ask questions. Um, and also, um, at the end of the webinar, there will be a survey that will, um, that will an exit survey, which will, um, which will come up. If you could complete that, I'd be really appreciated, because it's a great way in which CAD Corp can get feedback um, for future webinars and future events as well, so look out for that at the end of the um, at the end of the webinar. Um, we're just going to start with some um, instructions. So I'm talking, so I'll, I'll go first. My name's um, um, Gary Randall. I'm the um, the sales director at CADCorp and also the account manager um, for many of our emergency services um, customers, of which have joined us today. Um, Gemma, over to you. Hi everybody. I'm Gemma Polmere. I'm a GIS analyst here at CAD Corp. I've been here for about two years now. Um, before that, I was a GIS analyst at Nottinghamshire Fire and Rescue for 11 years. So I've started off where you guys are at the customer end um, using the CAD Corp product, and I'm now sort of working for CAD Corp as a consultant and for support. Excellent. Thank you, um, Gemma. Um, for the um, for the rest of the webinar, until we get to the Q and A section, um, Gemma and I are going to turn off our cameras now. And um, we found that sort of works best in terms of the sort of bandwidth and um, and the sort of performance of the webinar. So um, we're still going to be here in audio, um, but we're going to turn our cameras off. And like I say, we'll see you. Um, we'll see you. You'll see us again for the um, the Q and A section. So yeah, well, Gemma's waving goodbye, and I'll I'll wave goodbye as well, and I'll turn my camera off um, now. Um, so the plan um, for this um, for this um, webinar, um, we're going to be finished by 11 o'clock. Sorry, we're going to be finished by 12 o'clock, if not before. Um, I'm going to kick off um, with an um, sort of introduction, just to set the scene 
um, in terms of the um, of, of CAD Corp and the sort of content we're talking about um, today. And then I'm going to be handing um, back to my um, colleague um, Gemma for the um, resourcing to risk um, part of the um, webinar. And as I said earlier, we're going to finish off um, with questions, and we've got time um, scheduled for for to deal with any questions that um, that come up. So think about questions, and like I say, add them to the um, question box at any point throughout the um, throughout the webinar. Um, before we um, kick off um, with the CAD Corp content, we thought it'd be really good, um, and the feedback we've got from other um, webinars is it's, it's good to have some polls to, um, it's a way in which we can find out um, about where you guys are at and have some interaction um, early on in the webinar. So I'm going to um, start by um, um, launching the first um, poll. So um, I'm going to um, um, launch that now. Um, and the question is about your organization and it's about um, um, if you've got plans to um, review your community risk model or um, resource availability, whatever type of resources that is um, within the next um, 12 months. I'm just going to leave that just for a few seconds. I can see that people are, um, are voting um, now. So we're, um, we're over 80% of people have voted, um, which, is, which is great. So, I'm going to um, end that poll, and I can share I can share the results. Um, so you can see that actually overwhelmingly, um, or certainly the majority um, of organisations are planning to um, um, review their community risk model, which is um, um, a resource availability in the next 12 months, which is really interesting. Um, um, some people aren't, um, really small, um, a small amount, um, and other people are unsure. But yeah, so you. Um, um, it reassures CAD Corp that we're talking about um, about the right type of um, content. So I'm going to um, um, stop sharing that. Um, and we've also got um, just one other poll question as well, um, which I'm going to um, launch um, launch now. Um, and this is about um, how your organisation um, typically does um, community risk and resource availability modelling. Um, if if those types of terms don't exactly apply to your organization you could replace them with the word analysis or or modeling generally about whether you guys um, um, do it in-house whether you um, outsource it or whether you use a combination of um, of both um, and again i'm just going to just leave that for a few seconds um, until people have had a chance to um, to vote um, and um, counted down from three, two, one. I'm going to end that and I'm going to um, um, share the results. And that, um, um, I wasn't sure, um, obviously that's why we do polls, we're not sure what the results are going to be. I wasn't sure what um, what the result was um, was going to be, but it's really, really interesting um, that um, um, delegates this conference, is, conference have um, recognised the fact that um, using both um, in-house skills for modeling and outsourcing in certain situations um, um, makes um, uh, makes sense and that um, is good because it very much fits with the um, with the content that we've got to share with you um, share with you this morning so I'm going to um, stop sharing that um, and we're going to jump back into the um, jump back into the PowerPoint um, so kicking off the um, kicking off the introduction, um, I've got I've got one slide about CAD Corp. Um, so when I was looking at the um, delegate list earlier, there were lots of names that I, I recognised. Um, I've perhaps been on site to visit you, or we've um, had um, Teams meetings or phone calls over um, over recent over recent years. Um, but there's a few people that are new to CAD Corp. So I thought I'd just include one slide about um, our organization and, and who we are. Um, so we're a, um, if I had to use one word, it'd be GIS. We're a, a GIS company that do everything to do with mapping and sort of spatial analysis. And we do that by um, providing um, software. We do it um, by providing um, data and data services, um, and also through services. Um, so lots of different types of services, which I'll I'll go on to in more detail um, shortly. Um, um, GIS and these types of this type of spatial insight is um, relevant across lots of different sectors, which makes um, 
Um, life at Kaka, really interesting. We get to work with lots of different types of customers. Um, today, there is going to be a bias towards the first sector on that list, which is emergency um, emergency services. Although, as, as I said um, at the start, some of the terms that we're talking about um, do apply to um, do apply to other other sectors as well. Um, so today's to say predominantly about emergency services. Um, we're also focusing on on some of the services, particularly that CACOP um, um, uh, provides. Um, and if you went to our website and went to the services page, um, this is what would appear in front of you, and you'd see that CACOP can offer um, lots of different types of services, such as cloud hosting and training, for example. Um, today's webinar is very much focused on on one of those um, types of services, which is um, analysis and modeling. So when I hand back to Gemma shortly and we start looking at some of the case studies, they're very much focused on um, the analysis and modeling um, service. Uh, and at CADCorp, um, this has been um, an area of our business that's expanded rapidly over the last few years. Um, so we've, um, um, in similar, actually, as um, a similar way to the results of the poll that we've just seen, we have um, recognised the need um, that our customers um, do want to um, outsource um, services in certain situations. So to support that um, uh, need, um, CADCorp has expanded our um, modelling expertise within our technical services department. Um, there's a press release here from UK Fire Magazine, which was talking particularly about fire service modelling. Um, um, but this, um, these services very much apply to other, um, other organisations as well. So um, we've expanded our, our expertise. Um, there's a broad type of um, different um, modelling services that we provide. So again, um, this particular article was taken from um, the UK um, Fire Magazine, but does apply to other other sectors. Uh, and in that article, these were were some of the areas of um, business where CADCorp, um, where customers were using CADCorp services to help with their analysis and modelling. Um, so picking up on a few, it might have been resource optimization. So um, doing analysis to um, check that um, resources are in the in the best place to meet um, a changing demand, for example. Um, it could have been scenario modelling where um, our customers have been tapped on the shoulder by a management team to say, um, what would happen in this particular um, scenario, whether it's a changed um, set of resources or a changed set of demand. Um, so scenario modeling um, and just again, picking one. So it could be targeting and prioritization. So, so making sure that your um, resources are in the right place to meet certain targets. So there's lots of a broad type of modeling services that we, um, that we offer. Um, when we get to the sort of case studies section, Gemma's going to be covering a few of these, um, but not not all of them today. Um, please do contact us, um, or um, um, either by sending us an email or using the question section or the exit survey if you want more information about um, any of those um, areas um, during or after the webinar. We've been working with lots of organisations to provide these services um, um, recently. Um, so these are the badges of, of some organisations we've worked with that include um, North Yorkshire, South Yorkshire and West Yorkshire Fire Services. Um, my colleague um, Gemma has been um, working closely with Northern Ireland Fire Service on a, on a project um, and um, Cambridge, Royal Berkshire, Oxfordshire Fire are also organisations that we've um, worked with recently um, on, on, on modelling projects. And the feedback um, that we've been getting from these um, projects has been has been really great. So um, if you go to our website, you can see um, a number of testimonials. Um, for today, I've picked on Josh from um, Oxfordshire Fire Service, um, and he referenced the sort of positive experience that that um, they had. Um, also, very much how it complemented in-house modelling, which is um, again sort of goes nicely back to the um, the um, results of the poll that we saw um, earlier. Um, and also mentions external validation, which does get mentioned a lot when um, organisations approach us for our services. Um, along with um, the feedback from Josh, the type of um, feedback we've got from other customers about the benefits of um, um, our modelling services um, includes a number of things. So the first thing, again, um, which 
goes back to the poll again, I'm going to try and stop mentioning that, is the fact that it complements um, um, in-house expertise. So we're very much working, looking to work with your own resources um, to complement um, the work you do. And then often, for example, um, um, we can then pass the analysis back to your organization because you might want to complete further work um, as an example. But it's very much about complementing um, your existing in-house expertise. Um, using outsourced modeling services provides additional resources. So um, um, obviously, um, you guys um, are all busy. You've got um, broad um, jobs with lots of different responsibilities. And um, in some situations, when you get asked to do a particular project, um, there might not be internal resource in order to do that. So um, um, using CADCOP modeling services provides an additional resource for you guys um, at the time when you, um, when you most need it. Um, it also got the potential to reduce project delivery times. I suppose that's directly related to the um, um, point number two. Because we're providing additional resource, that means that um, there's the ability to turn projects around quicker. So that's um, that's also um, gets referenced um, a lot in feedback from customers. Um, and finally, um, what comes up time again, and it came up in um, Josh's quote that we just saw, is it provides external validation, um, which is really important for lots of reasons, and particularly it gets a reference when organisations are going out to public consultation. Um, so that's some of the, um, the major benefits. Um, so I'm actually going to now um, um, pass, a, pass back to Gemma. So um, um, Gemma's going to grab control of the um, of the screen shortly um, and start sharing her screen and I'm going to hand over to um, um, to Gemma and we'll she'll take um, take the reins so um, so Gemma I'm going to mute myself and it's over to you thank you Gary hopefully you can see my screen now yeah we can see the screen it's perfect Gemma thanks excellent okay so just to start off um, a lot of you here will be emergency services employees or maybe employees of of councils or other services, but um, you'll be very aware that there's constant pressure at the moment and get increasing all the time um, that you need to save money. There's uh, increasingly threats of cuts to frontline resources in this money saving. So all the back office cuts have all often been made over the past few years, and it's getting to the point now where to save further money, those cuts are really starting to be made uh, on the front line to your emergency response. Therefore, the uh, where you place your resources is absolutely critical. You know, making sure you've got everything in the right place is is fundamental to your your own success and performance. And also, um, more so now than ever before, you have more of a corporate corporate responsibility to demonstrate that your decision making is you know evidence based. HMIC inspections, anything like that. More and more, they want to see that any decisions that have been made, any plans that have been put in place have firm um, evidence-based decision making behind them. As emergency responders, you'll know that time is absolutely critical. It's critical to your performance, both in terms of saving lives, but also any sort of standards and targets that you're um, sort of signed up to meet. They tend to be measured in time. It might be an average response time. It might be a certain percentage of responses within a certain time, but everything comes down to time. And location is time in this sense. Where you have your frontline resources is absolutely fundamental and key to how quickly you can attend whereabouts you need to attend. So if location is key, then spatial analysis is absolutely fundamental to everything you do. So your resource planning, your risk analysis, your strategic management, all comes back down to the spatial aspect of are your resources in the best place. Some of you will already be uh, CAD Corp customers, so you'll be a bit aware of the sorts of things that we have. Um, we do have in-house software that a lot of you will already be using. We've got Sys Desktop, um, which is our sort of core GIS product for analysis. And then we've got a couple of plugins to Sys Desktop that are sort of geared mostly towards fire service. Um, workload modeler where you're sort of rerunning historic incidents with sets of resources to see the impact on attendance times and then risk modeler as well where you can build up your own risk model across your operational area based on any sorts of factors that you want to put in. We also have web map which 
although not directly used for analysis, is a really useful tool for perhaps disseminating the results of your analysis, whether that's internally or to the public, perhaps during a public consultation, for example. We've also got um, Cover Modeler, which is a, a new product for CAD Corp, which is based in the control room, which looks at uh, dynamically moving resources around and how that impacts on your attendance to risk areas. But the sort of main thing we want to talk to you about today is how CAD Corp can support you um, for your own analysis or you know, help you out <laughs> when, you're, when you're struggling with your own resources. So supporting your own analysis, we can offer extended support and consultancy days. So some of you here today actually already do this where as part of your CAD Corp um, contract, you have a number of extended support days built in that you can just pick and choose how you want to use them. Or you might want to sort of buy ad hoc, ad hoc consultancy uh, sort of call off call off days. We can help you with uh, de data preparation and processing of any data. Perhaps you know you've got the analysis skills, but you might not have the time to sort of bring all your data together and get it ready to to analyze things. Uh, we can provide quality assurance, which is actually um, sort of becoming increasingly more popular with with customers who do their own analysis especially when teams have often been decimated to maybe be a team of one person, where it's really useful for people to get a second eye cast over their work, just make sure everything looks okay before it sort of goes out to, to public. Our project consultancy services can vary hugely. It could be um, a workload modeling project. So you might have um, your historic incident data and you might have a number of scenarios that you want to to look at perhaps closing closing a fire station or ch making a change to your resources you might be looking into risk modeling where you've got a number of risk factors that you want to consider over your operational area and sort of map where your risk uh, where your risk sits and those two things can can sit together as well uh, and work together to see how how they impact upon each other uh, response and coverage modeling is another thing that sits really nicely alongside uh, risk modeling and workload modeling where rather than just looking at where how quickly you can respond to places you've historically visited or attended to you can get an idea across your whole area of how quickly you can attend everywhere so you know your commitment to the to the public no matter how busy you might be in that area how quickly you can actually get there and who would be your responder so these are sort of projects that we've we've worked on with different fire services in the past um, but that's not the end of it at all. There's scope to, to sort of tailor work packages to whatever your individual needs may be or whatever stage in your project you might be. The NFCC, NFCC National Definition of Risk Project has sort of been taking off in the past couple of years. Um, that's another thing that people are potentially looking to get support with or outsource. And that's something that CAD Corp tools can be um, really useful for. Now, it did say in the sort of description for this webinar that there'll be a bit of an update about ordnance survey data. And um, anyone who's heard me talk before at a CAD Corp conference will know that uh, average speed data is a bit of a pet subject of mine. And although it's a slight tangent for this, um, you'll see when it all comes together that, that actually this is really fundamental to the sorts of analysis that you might be doing. So it's quite a timely occasion to give you a bit of an update about the ordnance survey average speed data. Some of you may already be using this, some of you may not. Um, the, the good news recently for this is that since spring this year, OS average speed data has been part of the PSGA. So if your organization is a member of the PSGA, you can get this data for free, which is absolutely brilliant because it used to be extremely expensive. <laughs> so now you can use it for free and really improve your the accuracy of your modeling. Now, with the sorts of modeling you're likely to do, particularly for emergency services, routing along road networks is absolutely critical to, to, the, to the accuracy of your modeling. You know, we're not generally sending out helicopters or boats or anything like that. We are traveling along the road network um, to see how quickly we can get to where we get to. So having a good road network in your model is, uh, is really crucial. And the road speeds that you attach and use for your modeling um, for this road network affect absolutely everything. You know, you can have a perfect road network, amazing data, but if you uh, if you tell it 
that you're just going to go 30 miles an hour on every road, then you know it's not going to give the most accurate true to life results. So road speeds are really do affect everything you do in the modeling. So as accurate as you can get those, the more accurate your modeling is going to be. Now, something new about the recent average speed data, anybody who's had it in the past where you've had to pay for it will know that it's sort of linked to OS highways data. The latest one doesn't. It links to the OS NGD transport data. So it's a slightly different um, data set and um, it sort of comes with the speeds already attached, which is great. So there's no joining up data. The latest build of Sys desktop 9.1. So there's hopefully going to be a service release very soon. Um, but if you've got the latest monthly build, that will already be doing it. So latest uh, Sys 9.1 can process and route with this NGD transport data. So you can load it into the OS data loader tools and uh, process it, get your BDS file, and then just use it as you would have done with highways or ITN back in the day. Bidirectional routing is also included now. So you can create a routing expression that uses um, different speeds in different directions, which really you know helps go towards the the precision of your modeling this data can be used with workload modeler um, so at the moment you could you know create your BDS and, and use it in workload modeler with a routing expression as you would have in the past but uh, coming soon to workload modeler now I am assured this will be soon the developers working on it at the moment um, is going to be the option to use this average speed data for different times of day so depending on what time the incident occurs in workload modeler, it will use the relevant speed based on the time of day. Now, the software currently does do that with the old style average speed data as an option, but this is going to do it with the uh, with the new style data. And as I mentioned before, when you get the new style data, it's already attached to the road network. You don't have to mess around with the CSV file and joining based on a common field. It's already there. It's great. You just download it and it's all there ready to go. I'm just going to quickly show you here, anyone who's familiar with either highways or the old style data compared to the new. Um, highways in the NGD transport uh, network, they're basically the same in terms of the road classifications. They've got a slightly different name here. So in highways, you had form of way, which was, is it a dual carriageway, single carriageway, and so on. It's got a new name of description in the NGD, but it is basically the same classifications. So it's quite familiar when you look at it. Um, but a really key point here is anyone who's familiar with the old style data. So here we've got the weekday and weekend, the old style data. They had different time periods in there, but there was gaps. So some of the time periods were quite long and they covered several hours. And there were gaps where, you know, there were no data points for sort of use in the collection. The key thing to note about the new style data is it's a lot more granular. So you can get really down to quite precise speeds for different times of day. There's no gaps, as you can see. And there's lots of different ones. Each one's only like two or three hours long, basically, particularly in the weekdays. So you can get really good, precise speeds for different times of day, which is absolutely brilliant, especially because you can get it for free. Now, there's quite a lot of uses of the average speed data. Lots of you will be using it for these, these things already or looking to do so in the past uh, in your mobilizing system um, or as a backup to your mobilizing system in your command and control. Um, room, you know, if you're modeling traveling along the roads, you might not have access to other sort of live speed data. This can be brilliant for that. So great to get it in there and use it for that, which also applies to cover modeler. What I mentioned before, where moving resources around dynamically and seeing approach to risk. You can use it in risk modeler and workload modeler um, within uh, Sys desktop, as I sort of mentioned a bit before. Workload modeler, time of day speeds is coming, or you can just use a routing expression with the bi-directional stuff if you wanted to as well. Some of you may also be aware that workload model has the option to use two different root cost databases. Um, so you can sort of use one database to decide which resource to send and another database to say, well, how long did it actually take them to arrive? But this is really helpful if you want to replicate your decision making from your control room, which might use different data and then have the best you know best possible um reflection of reality in terms of actual travel times and especially with this really granular data now with the speeds it's great for that you can also use it in coverage mapping as well so looking at your operational area whereabouts your resources are you might want to include over border resources just looking at how quickly you can attend anywhere within your area and who's going to attend as well which can be really useful for um looking at 
you know, marking out station areas of responsibility, for example, and also quick changes to see if, if resources were altered in any way. It's also really useful if you wanted to sort of map your any predetermined attendances. So you might be interested in high rise buildings, for example. You might have um, a PDA for high rise of you know, six pumps and, a, and an ALP, as an example. Um, this speed data could be fundamental to sort of uh, working out how quickly you could fulfill that attendance in different locations, particularly where your high rise buildings might be. So we've had a little chat here about the OS average speed data. It's fundamental to a lot of the work you're likely to do or any sort of modeling um, or risk modeling in particular that you would do for emergency services or other services with GIS. I'm going to talk you through a few case studies now. These are real projects that we've um, done for fire services. Now, as I'm sure you'll appreciate the sort of confidentiality issues, so they're rather mysteriously named case study A, <laughs> B, C, and so on. Um, so we can't really give we can't really give any actual results or um, sort of identifying data away, but I can certainly talk you through the principles and show you some outputs that aren't too um, service specific, if you like. So case study A here was um, a customer who wanted to um, come to us with some help with workload modeling. They have the software themselves, but they were just under resourced. They didn't have the time. They had tight deadlines and they wanted to look at uh, degradation planning. So this has been quite a common theme recently with a lot of fire services. In particular, we've had the threat of strikes and people want to know that if they're down to a certain restricted number of resources, whereabouts should they um, whereabouts should they put them? So in this example here, um, we had three different options for where they could put 12 fire engines, basically. So geographical locations were decided. Each of these three scenarios, they're in slightly different places, and we wanted to see how well they could perform um, with these three different options. Now, this here is sort of based on some of the outputs from Workload Modeler. So this is saying um, for each scenario, what percentage of incidents were attended within this many minutes for the first appliance. So this is something you can create with work the model outputs. And then if you put that on a graph here, so number of minutes along the bottom, what percentage are attended within those minutes, any curve that is above the others is going to be um, the best performer, if you like. So you can see here the orange one, scenario B, um, you know, this is hitting more incidents in fewer minutes than the others. So scenario B comes out as being, you know, the best. And scenario A here, as you can see, sort of drops off in this section as, as being the worst performer. Whereas in this bit, um, scenario C was the worst performer. So that was one way to sort of visualize it, that suggesting scenario B is, is perhaps the best option. But we also wanted to look at it in a few other ways as well. So first of all, this service had an attendance target of um, a certain number of minutes. And this is looking at different breakdowns, so geographical risk, so they had a risk map um, across their operational area split into risk categories. So within these um, risk areas, what percentage of incidents were hit within the target for these different scenarios? Again, you can see here, other than for high risk areas, scenario B is coming out as the as victorious. It's the, got the best results within all the different risk areas, apart from high where C just edges it. And then also for um, incident risk so their incident categories are split into life risk property risk or other and you can see here again scenario b is putting quite a good case forward for being um, the best performer and look at another metric here this one was looking at the average attendance time so again there's an overall measure here but also broken down by risk area or by incident risk type you can see again scenario b is the winner in each in each, no matter how you look at it so there's loads of different metrics you can use to sort of put a figure on how successful something is, but pretty much anyone we looked at um, for this particular project, scenario B was the winner, which was great. It could, meant the service could go away with a plan for a degradation scenario. If they were down to 12 pumps, they knew where would be the best place to put them. Case study B. So this one was looking at um, risk modeling initially it's actually a project that had a few different parts to it but initially risk modeling so um, there was a methodology that had been used in the past that we adapted and developed and made a bit more robust uh, risk modeling on a household level and also um, a geographical area level so that was the first part of the of the work 
And then the second part was sort of part of a bigger asset strategy review, where making sure that all resources are best located, crucially to best coverage a best coverage of high risk areas. So the high risk areas that have been identified here, we're using those to say, um, are the resources in the best place? Um, and as also a part of this review, there was a, a single pump station model. So it's quite a common thing that people are looking at at the moment. You know, if they had to reduce their resources to just one per fire station, how would that look? What would the impact be? And then this was a really inter interesting part where they wanted to look at the locational value of each station. So not how valuable the station is based on what resources they happen to have there, but if all stations were made equal um, and had the same resources, and the only thing that differed was their location, um, what was their individual contribution to various measures of success? So that might be hitting attendance targets, attending risk areas, or even how the, the relative value of different station locations changes at time of day. A few of the little results here. So firstly, we're here looking at the, the single pump station model. So these are the graphs that are similar to what I showed you before. And um, we've got a base case model here where resources as they currently are. We've got the yellow line here, which is the um, the scenario where the single pumps stations are there. So the second pumps have, or even third pumps have been removed. And this is looking at first appliance um, arrival times. So you can see there's not a massive difference uh, and that's to be expected because by the very nature of this model we're only removing second appliances and if we're looking at first appliance arrival times the only time that second appliance removals are going to really impact that are going to be when you've got big incidents kicking off at the same time so the usual quickest responding appliance isn't available so they have to send somebody else so it's to be expected i mean the base case obviously is performing better but only slightly However, if you look over here, we've got the second appliance um, arrival times, and that's where you really see the difference because all of the second appliances have been removed from, from the model. So, you know, the second one to turn up is by definition has to be from another station. So you can really start to see there what the impact is on the uh, attendance times. And they didn't have an, um, a target for second appliance arrival, but you could see just what the degradation level was. Um, so this is kind of a visualization of the equalized station model. So looking at station location only. So every station is made the same. They've got the same resources with the same delays and so on. Um, and what I did here was basically ran a, ran a base case with all of the stations there and then run individual models with one station removed each time and then looked at the impact on performance for each of those models. So this one here, for example, with station 14 removed from the model, um, the number of percentage is the percentage of incidents in high risk areas attended within 11 minutes dropped from, you know, the base case would have been around this to 66 percent. So the, the impact was biggest removing station 14. And um, so I've looked at a few different measures here to sort of decide on a, on a particular metric. So we've got percentage of incidents in high risk within 11 percentage of high incidents in high risk within 14, and then the mean first pump attendance times to high risk. This was specifically looking at attendance to high risk areas. Once these three factors are all considered, you can start to rank the stations. So what this meant was the service, if they had to look at um, a degradation scenario where they had to perhaps remove a station for a day or a period of time, they can see, you know, this is the most important one in terms of attendance to high risk. This is not the one to remove. Look down the bottom and start, you know, removing from this end. Now, it's key to note that this didn't look at any interaction effects where, you know, geographically close stations would have um, a bigger impact if both of them were removed. This was just looking at stations individually, but it gave a really useful starting point um, for if they started to have to think about changing their resources. And then this slide here, it's a bit of a um, an optical illusion type slide, but this is just looking at all the different station locations along the top. So these are the stations. Um, these are the hours of the day, and this is saying for each hour of the day, what share of the overall workload happened at that particular station. So again, you can see these two stations stick out as having you know, the, the biggest share of the workload all of the day, really. But um, it starts off at you know, station 14 becomes the, um, is the most important one, and that kind of swaps over during the day to station 23 taking over um, sort of in the afternoon and then back to station 14 at night. And uh, you know these sort of results were looked at in context with the 
um, characteristics of the geographical locations of these stations. So are they city centre type places? Are they more rural? Are people there all night and all day? Are people just leaving those areas in the day and so on? So this was really useful for them to sort of see at different times of day which stations become relatively more or less important. Case study C. Now this one was done as a as a call off consultancy basis. So rather than having a detailed project spec at the start that was sort of all agreed and decided beforehand, this sort of evolved as time went on and they, it was based on a number of consultancy days that were just used as and when they were needed as the project developed. And this project um, was actually one we did for, a, we've done it for a few fire services, but it's creating a static response model. So by static response model, what we mean is if all of your resources are at home um, in their sort of locations, they're all available, you know, in terms of your top down operational planning, um, what, where, where will they be responding to? So where will each response, um, where will each resource be the quickest to respond and how quickly does it take to get there? So you're just getting a really sort of top down view of your geographical area, who's going to respond where and how quickly they can respond. And obviously you can relate that to your um, attendance targets. There's a few screenshots here that are zoomed in enough to sort of stay a bit anonymous. So this example here is just showing these are fire station locations. And this is showing that within this area, this is going to be the quickest responding station. So that takes into account turnout times for individual appliances, but also travel times along the road network, where, of course, road speeds come into it. So you can see effectively giving each station um, what you might have called in the olden days a turnout area. Um, but they're useful for lots of things. So um, useful to know if if you remove a resource, who's going to take up, who's going to take over the work, um, or perhaps if you're looking to distribute responsibility to different stations, whether that's community safety work or fire protection work or or anything else. Um, it's sort of handy starting point to sort of have each area, uh, each station's likely turnout area. Sort of to overlay on that there. This is showing what the actual response times were to these uh, different geographic locations. So you can see you know, close to the fire stations, the response time is quicker, but it's really useful to start highlighting the locations where perhaps response is a bit slower because it's further away from your resources or the roads are poor or whatever it might be, um, which can be really useful for targeting sort of community initiatives and that kind of thing. And it works really well alongside Workload Modeler because Workload Modeler won't tell you anything about these places if, if nothing's really happened there. So unless you've had a lot of incidents in these areas, it won't really reflect in your attendance times and you won't necessarily know that you might have black spots of sort of slow attendance. So it's really useful to put all these layers together to make a really holistic view. And then finally, these um, case study D, again, we've done this for a couple of services as well. I don't have any pretty pictures for this one, unfortunately, because it's um, some quality assurance. So in this case, uh, services had created their own workload modeler database. They'd done their own analysis. They'd modeled some scenarios in a base case and done some comparisons and so on. And they wanted um, an external eye to be cast over that to make sure everything looked OK with the database and the data. There was no errors, no issues. They'd made the most of everything they'd done. And services find this really, really useful. Um, Certainly when I was at Knott's Fire, it would have been quite useful for us when we were down to often just down to me as one analyst um, when you can't you know, discuss it with anybody who really knows what you're talking about. It's a really, really useful thing to have. So that was just a few examples there of some projects that we've uh, that we've done in various different ways. Um, it's obviously not exhaustive. We can take things a lot further, but just so for some key takeaways. Um, time is the absolute key to performance, whether it's your attendance standards or um, even if you don't have a, a committed a standard just to look at how well you're performing. Location is absolutely fundamental to time because whereabouts you are influences how quickly it takes you to get there. Your underlying data impacts everything in your modeling and road speeds, road speeds, road speeds. I can't stress enough how important these can be to do really robust modeling. You can bring together all these different strands of analysis to give a full picture. So this could be your risk modeling, your workload modeling and your coverage modeling or any other modeling you might do as well. You know, they don't stand alone in isolation. You can really make a proper, especially if you're doing like an IRMP or anything like that. Bringing all of this stuff together really does show that you're looking at data and making good intelligence based decisions. 
And CAD Corp can assist you in this in lots of different ways. We can offer extended support. Obviously, you've got your, your usual support, but extended support if you want some real detailed help for a day or two or anything like that. Uh, quality assurance to sort of help you along the way with your own work or after completing a project or even, you know, full project um, with the full project management from you know, inception to, to completion, um, which can also be done as sort of call off consultancy days rather than having like a full project spec right at the start. And that's about it from me. I'm going to hand back to Gary now um, and we will field some questions. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gemma. Um, I think um, what we're going to do now is actually, Gemma, if you want to um, stop sharing your screen um, and also turn your camera on, we'll um, we'll go back to um, go back to cameras and we can um, go through the um, go through the questions um, that we've um, that we've that we've got. And we've actually um, thanks for using the question function. We've got we've got a lot of questions that have come through. Um, we um, um, I'll pick um, I'll pick a handful of them. And we might not get the opportunity to answer all the questions that have been have been posted. Um, but if we if we don't answer them now, um, then myself or Gemma will get in contact with you and um, and answer them. Um, hopefully this afternoon, or if not um, um, tomorrow. Um, so actually, Gemma, um, the first question seems to be very much in your camp, and um, it's about average speed data. So um, mm -hmm. the specific question is about um, how the OS average speed data uh, matches the actual travel time of appliances and I know you've got uh, some experience so on that so over to you. Yeah that's a, that's a really good question actually so um, what a lot of services have done in the past when they've used the older style data is they've looked at their own historic data and um, sort of the sort of turnout travel times and so on and done a bit of work to to use the different options at different times of day and so on and see how well the, um, the data matches and Historically, people find it it matches really well, certainly compared to anything else they could use. So you know, generic road speeds or um, road speeds pinched from somebody else, so key road speeds for their area. But what people often find is if they, if they have to use, for example, just one time of day speed, they might want to pick one, perhaps an off peak speed to replicate blue light, but um, maybe adjust it a little bit. So increase the speed by 10 percent or something like that and just sort of hone it to to best match. Um, what they actually find in their own operational area. But yes, the new speed data particularly, which is very granular, um, particularly if you do use the different time of day option, is, is going to be probably the, the best option you'll have for replicating your own travel times. Yeah, great. Thanks, Gemma. That sounds like good advice. And also do remember, it's just such a massive step forward compared to not using the average speed. So, um, so that is um, just worth um, worth remembering. Um, the second question is probably more um, I, I can pick up. So it's um, it's a question we come across a lot actually. It's about um, do we need a specification for um, project work? Um, what we tend to um, find is that um, sometimes um, customers approach us and they know exactly what they want. So they say, okay, Cacorp, we want you to do A, B, and C, and um, and that's all great. Um, but often that's not the case. So often um, an organisation might know that they want to. Um, a bit of help with something, but it's just difficult to define at the time. Um, I suppose the the message from CACOP that's absolutely fine. And I think it was Gemma's case study C. I think she mentioned that um, we can um, sort of operate in a, on a sort of call off basis, so organisations can assign a sort of block of consultancy, and we can we can call that off as we um, as as we as we require. So that's um, that's the specification. Um, I think the next question, Gemma, I'll probably pass back to you as well, which is um, um, what data sets um, do you um, recommend using for risk modelling? Can you give us a flavour for the type of data sets that might come into um, into the mix? Yeah, um, I mean, it it all depends what you've got. So your own um, incident data will sort of become the basis. But if you license anything such as Mosaic or Acorn or any associated demographic data sets, um, they're really useful for looking at sort of a household level or, or profiling the sorts of households who are likely to have certain incidents. So you can bring that in. Um, always road speed, so travel time stuff can come in there as well. Um, and anything you can get from local councils is often really helpful. If you can get data about assisted bin collections even or, or things like that, trying to identify vulnerable people. Um, but also environmental data, so flood data. Um, there's all sorts you can use. Um, the NFCC definition of risk project has obviously gone quite a way to identify 
data sets that everybody can access for free. That's a great starting point for this, but certainly there are other data sets out there that you can sort of augment this, these sort of methodologies with and take things further. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks, um, Gemma. Um, next, we've got a question from one of the um, police um, people that's attended um, today. Um, he's actually, um, he's Joel, um, he's um, doing two tasks at the same time. So he's, he's watching this webinar and he's also going on to the OS um, data hub and he's trying to find the, um, the road speed data and can't find it. So he's asking sort of whereabouts that um, is. Um, it's part, I think the big thing that you're looking for is the NGD, so National Geospatial Data, and it's a transport link that you're looking for. And um, I've not done it myself, Gemma, so correct me if I'm wrong, but once you get the transport links, then the average speed data is part of a, an attribute of that data, is that correct? Yeah, so if you create your little recipe, as they say, where you sort of make sure you select any options that involve RAMI, so the routing and um, management information, make sure you include that. Um, yeah, you basically get the files, stick them in the um, OS uh, network manager tool within Sys, um, and then it will just create the BDS for you with all the speeds attached. It's really easy. Yeah, great. Thanks, um, thanks, Gemma. Uh, next question I'll pick up on. Um, this was um, raised um, earlier um, about um, there's been lots of mention of fire, and I, I did sort of um, it was a caveat at the start that we did um, some of the cases are a bit biased to fire, but about how they apply to um, police. So. Um, Obviously, the question we just had um, also shows that the concepts applied to police, which is which is great. But they very much do. So obviously, you've got the same as part of the PSGA. You've got the same data sets as fire services um, and the types of analysis um, when you're looking at resources and mobilizing and certainly risk, community risk. Um, you're interacting in different ways, but um, the concepts very much apply to um, to all emergency services, including um, including police forces as well. So um, so yeah, if you have any specific questions about um, particular projects you're you're looking at or need assistance with then um, then drop us a line after the um after the event um and then probably the the final question that i've um i've got um that we'll probably do and then we'll think about closing it because i know um it's gonna be lunchtime before we know it um it's about what's the particularly it's about degradation analysis which i know is one of the um one of the examples that um, Gemma mentioned, and it's about what what's the lead time for degradation analysis. And um, I suppose this response um, is the same for any type of uh, um, analysis that we have. So it very much, it just depends on what projects we've got on at the time. Um, so what I'd say is just send us the details um, of the project you're looking at, um, and then based upon the scope and um, existing commitments, we can offer advice on the on the lead time. Um, but we try to keep that as as quickly or reduce the lead time as much as we can, so that we can deliver um, the projects that you need when you need them. Um, so, um, Gemma, I think we'll probably bring it bring it to a close um, now. I've got a clock sort of ticking away in front of me. So, I suppose I'd like to just um, thank you all for um, attending um, the webinar. Um, feel free to. Um, to contact us after this so um, you can email um, myself and Gemma um, directly Our email addresses are um, first name dot second name at cadcorp um, dot com um, there will also be um, a exit survey as well and within the exit survey there's the opportunity to um, to add um, questions and ask us to contact you about particular um, follow-up that you might need so um, so you can do that um, as well um, and we also have a generic email address which is sales at cadcorp.com so please feel free to um, um, use um, use that um, you can also pick up the phone and um, and dial the main switchboard as well and the numbers on our on our main website so um, on behalf of myself and Gemma I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your your day and attending this webinar um, and we look forward to um, speaking to you and seeing you soon so all the best take care bye everybody thank you